Hi, this is Dan Siegel, author of the book Aware and the book Mind and the Developing Mind, and you're listening to The Soul of Life. I didn't even see it coming. We were hit, a driver ran through a red light, and my husband did, but right at the last moment. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak to Dr. Leslie Tate Gould. And we were hit on the side. Leslie runs an outpatient trauma and counseling center in Newport Beach, California. My body was kind of in a bit of a stuck process of looking toward the right. We talk about her specialization in a form of body-focused trauma treatment called somatic experiencing, or SE, and her experience of benefiting from SE herself. Our body sometimes will get hung up on wanting then to be able to prevent it in the future, right? So my body, even a few months later, was very vigilant. Somatic experiencing was developed by Peter Levine and like IFS, therapy deviates from the norms and traditions of talk therapy and its typical cognitive and rational focus. Sometimes emotions are like people would rather kind of stay away from them. Instead, SE focuses on so-called bottom-up neurological processing. Emotions are, in their simplest form, they're there to be felt. We talk about how it's possible to attend to your feelings and sensations in a deeper way when you aren't narrating and talking and explaining. Am I trying to maybe engage a particular uh, intervention because I want to do it right? Or is this actually what I'm feeling connected with in the session? The way that I do my best SE work is to trust that I'm using my body as a rich information center. Leslie and I talk about how micro tracking of motor movements in the body unlocks a world of information that can be slowed down, processed, and released. Tourette's are actually better accounted for some of these physiological stuck features where our body's kind of in this feedback loop and it wants to find its way out. And we discuss our similar personal journeys, needing to be patient zero using our own medicine. I had just suffered a few months prior a miscarriage and I was pregnant during the car accident. The practitioner in that session had me actually very slowly and really intentionally kind of work with moving my head. Welcome to The Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is episode four of season four, Healing Trauma with Somatic Experiencing. Here we were on the side of the road, and then our car gets loaded up on a tow truck, and we didn't have a way home. There was no definition of the mind that anybody had. I'm Keith Miller. That's really weird. Can we swear on this? Something you hear at a swing party. (laughs) (laughs) That that sounds fun. We don't treat trauma. We treat the imprint of traumatic experience. I stood on top of the Olympic podium, very incomplete, not happy, and never ever thinking that I was good enough. Donald watched his older brother be destroyed that way. So he had to exile all of those sensitive parts of him. Free soloing is climbing without ropes. Alex was born for climbing. Cannabis use disorder is real. There's no question about it. The, the broccoli growers of America are livid every time that they listen to this part of your podcast. What happens before sex? What happens during sex? What happens after sex? Compassion is contagious. We gotta have cake. Oh my God, I totally am bisexual and that's where I gotta be. He's incredibly successful by just talking shit about people's fried rice. This is the soul of life. Hey, it's Keith Miller. I just want you to know that I've created a bunch of inexpensive and free courses on marriage improvement, mindfulness, and stress reduction. Just head on over to souloflifeshow.com forward slash courses and check out the cool resources there. Again, that's souloflifeshow.com forward slash courses. My guest today on The Soul of Life is Dr. Leslie Tate Gould. She's the co-founder and the executive director of Lido Wellness Center in California. She was inspired to open Lido following her experience working in residential treatment facilities specializing in addiction and eating disorders for both adults and adolescents. Today, I'm especially going to speak with her about something called somatic experiencing. We'll talk about polyvagal theory, maybe, mood disorders for sure, substance abuse, all sorts of things that relate to the body and how we experience ourselves, our emotions, our inner life, and how we can focus on those to maybe change and transform what's going on inside of us. Leslie, how are you? Welcome to the Soul of Life today. Thank you so much, Keith. I'm doing well. 
Great. It's great to have you. I'd love to kind of jump right in. Maybe you can explain and, and share a little bit about the Lido Clinic and tell us about what you do. Yeah, thank you. So Lido Wellness Center, we've been open since 2018, and we are a program in Newport Beach, California, and we specialize in primary mental health um, and so what that means just for, you know, those that might be interested in coming to a clinic like ours is we specialize in uh, mood disturbances. So that is kind of under the category of anxiety disorders, uh, major depressive disorders, bipolar disorders. And then we also um, kind of further our reach of specialization into trauma and stressor related disorders. So that can be, you know, um, what we hear a lot. It's, it's you know, fortunately getting a lot more um you know, kind of spoken about in the general public. So that can be like a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis or an acute stressor-related um, diagnosis. It can also be, you know, maybe somebody who's going through like an a, acute um, life stressor, like bereavement, um, a traumatic incident, grief, and loss. We can really kind of get a lot of support around people and get them back on their feet. I imagine you have to be creative in how you do that. People show up with different attitudes about treatment, um, relationship to themselves or, or lack thereof, um, sometimes even, um, you know, with feeling animosity towards themselves, animosity towards the condition they're, they're being diagnosed with. They don't want to accept the feelings uh, that feel out of control or the behaviors that feel out of control. So tell me a little bit of how you approach and maybe what makes some of the things that you offer to your clients, um, you know how how do you how do you deal with that and how do you begin to help people become more at ease with the process and with themselves? It's a really good question um, mm-hmm. because you're right. You know, every person coming into a program like ours is in a different season in their life. Someone like myself, who's a somatic experiencing practitioner, I really have a niche in um, really working with individuals that might be struggling with, you know, post-traumatic stress presentations, um, flashbacks, um, difficulties, you know, like really integrating maybe traumatic memories. But I also have a former, you know, specialization and background in working with addiction and also an eating disorder population. So I tend to really do well and really... um, you know, kind of help people integrate um, some of that work with, say, maybe someone who's, in in our terms, like what we would call like someone who's maybe become very disembodied, where, in, you know, in, in other aspects of their life, they might be like a high-powered executive. They might, you know, have a family of three at home who they're able to govern and do really well with. But if I were to slow them down in a session and invite them to, hey, let's just like for a moment notice your breath or let's notice like even what your feet feel like under, you know, where you're sitting in your chair, that might actually be hard for them to navigate. And so someone like myself um, who can come in and really work on kind of reestablishing some awareness of what's happening with their body, what's happening with their breath and what's happening also with their emotions you know, emotions are, you know, in their simplest form, they're there to be felt. But depending on somebody's circumstances and where they've come from, how emotions have been, you know, modeled or valued or cherished in their upbringing, um, sometimes emotions are like people would rather kind of stay away from them. Yeah, you mentioned um, sort of really starting with sort of the bottom up almost. And we'll talk a little bit about that maybe sort of concept because of how the nervous system works and even as you're talking about emotions, how they're really a sensory experience. When I teach about mindfulness and teach about mindfulness-based stress reduction, I'm an IFS practitioner using internal family systems. So it's all focused on the inner life. It's not so much the family. That's that's the sort of the the, the trick there with that <laughs> that term, internal family systems, getting to know your your inner life. And uh, I use the word sometimes decomposing or getting to know the the um, uncomposed version of you, and uh, and anybody who knows my podcast and my tr- kind of trajectory and, and why I started doing this a year ago is because of you know, as a tra- as a practitioner for twenty years, and, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit, Leslie. How you know we can do this work, or we can anybody out there can do their life, and probably pre- be be pretty good at it. But at a certain point, as as people know, the body keeps the score. I interviewed Bessel van der Kolk a few a couple months ago. Um, you know what we know now about the body, and as it relates to you know, yeah, I wonder if it has an effect how I relate to myself. Do I disassociate when I'm working? Could, is it possible to be 
a really high functional person and have your life together and actually be helping other people with quote unquote more severe trauma. And actually you're disassociating the whole time. So these are questions mm -hmm. I've been asking myself as I struggle with why have I had hypertension since I was in my twenties? Um, why am I dealing with the depression now in my forties that has really kind of escaped diagnosis for who knows how many years or decades, right? So foundational bottom up type of questions. To what you exactly said, how we are also the vessels through this work, right? But I also had not had a lot of like very formal experience with trauma. By no means was I immune to having the exposure to trauma, but it wasn't anything explicitly addressed, talked about, you know, explored in a graduate setting and in my internship. But my background was from top-down approaches. You know, I wrote my dissertation, um, you know, around cognitive behavioral therapy and how to make it more culturally adaptive and sensitive. Let me jump in and, and say, if I can, that sort of you're referencing top-down, meaning like sort of rational or kind of thought regulating emotion type of things. Absolutely. Right. So, you know, utilizing that present focus, it was like a total paradigm shift for me. Maybe you can break down like what, what, what's the difference between talk therapy and SE? When I first got introduced to some of the, the methods in somatic work, I really had to seek out, and the requirement is also to have consultation. I had to have the consultation around Am I trying to maybe engage like a particular uh, intervention because I want to do it right? Or is this actually what I'm feeling connected with in the session? Mm. And mm. it's taken me many years of being now a somatic worker to know that the way that I do my best SE work is to trust that I'm using my body as a rich, like kind of information center we have different channels in how we kind of organize ourselves throughout the world. And so one of those channels is sensation. There's embodied affect or emotion. There's behaviors, there's images and thoughts or meaning, right? So when I first set out on this work, I thought, okay, well, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. So surely emotions and meaning are going to be like my primary channels, but once I started doing some of my own session work, you know, on this side of the chair, because that's a requirement to become a practitioner of this craft, I actually discovered and was really excited to have the kind of almost like this new, you know, kind of wisdom un unleashed from me. My primary mode of how I move through the world is through a sensation channel. And so I use, and I, I want to say IFS also uses this term, but you'd have, you'd have to correct me on that because I'm not an IFS practitioner. I use a lot of co-regulation. So I'll, you know, I'll be seated, you know, across from someone and I'll get a sense of something, whether it's like a, a visceral sensory component, or I'll have like an image pop in my mind that when I'm working with patients, I call it like my, I almost like visualize it as like a marquee like above a, a movie theater. And so I'll just have like a, a phrase of words pop up or a feeling or or definitely like a visceral component. And I'll just share that. Like, gosh, I'm really getting a sense of this. What are you noticing? And sometimes it's a, a miss, right? Sometimes they'll say, well, gosh, no, I feel something completely different. And we'll just sit with that and we'll kind of, you know, wrestle with that. But there's a lot of times where there is something regulating kind of within that energy between us um, that's very real. And so I really like to work with mm -hmm. that. So in other words, when you're using that sort of um, your own emotional intelligence to not just be aware of what you're feeling, but how you're feeling in relation to what the other person is feeling. And right. then venturing a guess or kind of um, offering like, I, I, I just started to feel a little um, like tense right now. Do you feel that too? And right, sort of like, as inviting them into the co-regulation. Mm -hmm. Noticing different changes in their breath, noticing kind right. of maybe if their you know, pulse is changing, their color in their face, what emotions coming up behind the eyes, perhaps through some moisture or tearfulness, right? We're trained to be really heightened for noticing those changes because it might be an inroad to whether it's trauma reprocessing or, you know, kind of seeking out some connection to a supportive image that could really help them with that trauma renegotiation. Um, so it's, it's very active work. In fact, you know, sometimes after somatic experiencing sessions, I'll need to kind of 
compose myself, right? So I'll need to go like take a walk. I'll need to go just be out with nature um, because there's a lot mm-hmm. also that we're kind of noticing and, and regulating within our own bodies. Yeah, that's great that you mentioned that because I was going to ask you about how, how you do self-care because burnout has been, I think it's a word that people use in our profession because they don't want to say that they're depressed because that triggers more, somehow more uh, attention and focus and like, you know, it's more of a problem. I don't know what your experience and experience with that is and how you, how you know how close you need to be to your work or like it's because work is work. Sometimes we don't have a choice. We built our life around this, this skill that you then have to offer to people. But as a colleague was sharing with me the other day, like, you know, I'm going through X, Y, and Z. I'm going through an illness. I'm going through a divorce. I'm going through something. How am I going to be able to offer Right, this to my my clients when you know it's the instrument we use is is ourself, right? Mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to have a team of providers around me that I can consult with. I think consultation in this type of work is um, it's non negotiable (laughs) in in my world. Um, When you're working with high acuity, um, you need to be able to not be like the end all person in the room because we need that. But we're human too. We are going through things. I remember just as this is jumping back to the idea of co-regulation, but, but you reminded me of when I heard Peter Levine speak once, he was describing, maybe you've heard the story he was talking about. I think he was in Germany. Ironically, tragically, he, um, it was either him or, a colleague, but I think it was him. He was like literally run over by a Volkswagen. Like he was hit, he was hurt. Um, and people were coming to attend. He was you know, crossing the street and people came to attend to him. And the first person was asking him all these questions like, what's wrong and where, you know, so he was kind of doing a full top to body, you know, check of everything that was wrong. And he knew at that moment he said that he was going to die. And then that person, you know, was replaced by the EMT, the professional came in. And then, um, I, I forget if I'm getting the story wrong, but someone else showed up. It, it, it was a woman and she just ho- held his hand and looked at him and just said, I'm here. I'm not going to leave you and everything's going to be okay. And he said, at that moment, he knew that he was going to be okay and he was going to live. And so the stark differences in how we, um, receive, um, inputs from others, right? And how it makes such a big difference. Oh, yeah. I mean, that that example is is mentioned beautifully in, I think it might have been, been his first book, In an Unspoken Voice. And it talks about that accident in great detail. And it's interesting that you bring up that example because speaking to the degree of, you know, we we're moving through this work, but we're also being impacted as, you know, human beings. And I remember... I was in my second year of somatic experiencing um, training and my husband and I were in not a, a severe car accident in which, you know, we didn't require any like, you know, ambulatory services, but it was pretty severe in our world, you know, um, and it was quite shocking. You know, the car was, you know, immobilized and that exact thing happened And because I had read Peter's work and I was like right in the midst of being enrolled in that course, there were a few key elements that I take away that really allowed my husband and I not to develop full-blown PTSD symptoms. One Mm. of which was attending to supportive individuals that had calmer voice, that were more kind of, you know, you know, kind of those safe people that we could really look to after that accident. Because we definitely had that dichotomy of we had a, you know, off-duty EMT who was peppering us with questions. And both of us were like, too much. That's mm-hmm. too much. Anxious attention. Yes, very much. And and to to be fair though, that's how they're trained in the job. Yeah, they're just right? doing a job, which is why, especially those of us who are high functioning are like, well, I'm just doing my job. Just right. sort of, I've just got to clean the kitchen like fit, right. for the fifth time. Right. Their, their tolerance of intensity, they're very calm, but they don't realize at times how they might be coming across. And the other right. thing that I totally credit, and I use this technique a lot with patients, especially if I've just had a session in which there's been a lot of charge, there's been a lot of intensity, is here we were on the side of the road, we're taking our statements, and then our car gets loaded up on a tow truck, and we didn't have a way home. 
And fortunately, it happened where we were very close. And I, I said to my husband, I said, let's just walk. And that walking to discharge some of that intense energy, I really believe was such a shifting and opportunity for our bodies not to get trapped. Um, and so I use walking a lot with patients, you know, to get out. I use it with my own family. You know, I've got a family member who's mm-hmm. really going through some stuff right now. And I, I shared with her the other day, she's really, you know, struggling with some onset of some panic, which has never been something she's had. And I said, honey, just, you know, do what you can walk up and down the stairs gently, be looking around, mm-hmm. looking at the pictures, right? Like anything mm-hmm. that we can do to kind of have that left, right support and kind of ground some of that intense energy that we can feel in moments like car accident or other kind of shocking endeavors. Let's talk a little bit about this idea that you just mentioned that, that, you know, you had an experience, you, you mobilized your, yourself and, and was able to turn the, traumatic energy which would maybe maybe we talk about fight or flight energy from like the overwhelm uh and fear and uh, intense chemicals that are being released because of the accident and you mobilize and you you discharged it so that it didn't get trapped and i want i wonder if you can speak to that particular concept in somatic experiencing mm-hmm. yeah there's a, a few different things that that i really called upon One, again, because I was enrolled in the training and believe it or not, the second year of our certification course is all about accidents. So we cover things like trip and falls and then, you know, kind of working our way up to um, intensity with actual car accidents. And so I remember uh, when at one of our lectures, you know, the facilitator looked out in the room and said, has anyone been in a recent accident? And mine had happened just two months prior. that I was still having some residual kind of startling when entering an intersection. We were hit, a driver ran through a red light and we were hit on the Mm. side. Um, And so I didn't even see it coming. Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. And my husband Mm. did, but right at the last moment. Mm -hmm. And so the practitioner was able to really work with me in that setting in really slowing down, my body was kind of in a bit of a stuck um, process of looking toward the right um, because that's what our body does when when we're not able to prepare for something. When something is shocking, like an accident that we don't see coming, our body sometimes will get hung up on wanting then to be able to prevent it in the future, right? So my mm-hmm. body, even a few months later, was very vigilant in looking toward the right when I would be entering into intersections, even if I had a green light and had the go-ahead. So the practitioner in that actual um, session had me actually very slowly and really intentionally kind of work with moving my head, but doing it in such a way where it wasn't so rapid, right? Because when we're kind of in that stuck energy, our bodies, it's its like um, sometimes, and there's so much more great research now on Tourette's um, presentations, that sometimes Tourette's are actually better accounted for some of these physiological stuck features, right? Where our body's kind of in this feedback loop and it wants to, mm-hmm. it wants mm-hmm. to find its Com- way out. Compulsively. But, right. Yeah. But it's been reinforced. And mm-hmm. so we worked together with slowing that down and it's been so many years now, it's been about five years, but I recall a lot of heat exchanged down through my shoulder. There was also a lot of imagery that was pulled into that session because at the time, um, what was also greatly impacting me was that um, I had just suffered a few months prior a miscarriage and I was pregnant during the car accident. And so for me, it was that grappling of, this could have gone a very different way. Um, And so to be able to work with that imagery of working with that supportive image of that woman on the side of the road, working together in that actual session with the acknowledgement that both my husband and I were very much attentive to one another, right? Because in the moment, it's all just so shocking, right? And so that session really slowed it down almost as though I had a frame by frame analysis of what occurred, but to be able to focus on 
what actually, and SE is so known for this, right? What was actually resourceful during those frames that could otherwise, if I had only looked at what didn't help or what was really scary or frightening, would have understandably just continued to kind of loop me back into a feeling of right. overwhelm. Right. You're, right. You're giving yourself permission. You're giving your body permission to have this extreme response. Right. Right. And through the heat, right? So the heat was exchanged. My range of motion improved. And mm -hmm. all of that was gained. Like the, the practitioner was so skilled. Of course, he was leading a group of 60 of us. Um, but he was so skilled to work with that range of motion. And that was what gave him these inroads to slow all of these other images down. Right. Mm -hmm. But if he had just sat mm -hmm. me down and said, well, gosh, you know, you mentioned being in a car accident a few months ago. Tell me what that was like. There's no way, mm -hmm. you know, I would have naturally, mm -hmm. and and as do so many of our patients, so many, it's like our human nature to go toward what didn't work, right? Because it's, yeah. what it's we our know, nature. What we, yeah. Right. Like we're built to survive, right? Mm -hmm. So if our, if our survival says, well, I need to prevent that in the future, what are all the mm -hmm. ways that I can do that to prevent it? Then mm -hmm. we get lost in the loop of what was scary, what was difficult. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of the unknowns, Leslie, would you say? Like some of the things that we we don't fully have a grasp of, but actually in order to heal, we need to sort of relax into and, and make peace with. We need to be able to relax into knowing that with trauma, there's always the, the sides that are resourceful. And then there's always the side, I say always, I probably shouldn't say always as practitioners, we coach our patients not to say always. There's the side that have resource, but then there's also the side that has the overwhelm. Yeah. We can only get to the resource at times going through the overwhelm. But yeah. if we go too quickly, as we see, right, and that's why sometimes things like critical incident reporting can actually be really kind of reigniting some of the trauma response the belief used to be that we had to go directly toward the overwhelm first right? That we had to get in there and kind of talk it through and, and work with it. Mm -hmm. But it's somatic experiencing and some of the other, you know, endeavors that I'm looking into as far as heightening even my awareness of body modalities through like integral somatic psychology is we need to be able to kind of be kind of pendulating. We use that term a lot, pendulating through what's working, what's resourced, what, what feels safe, and then also to then dip toes into some of that overwhelm. If we mm -hmm. had, you mm -hmm. know, you know, like really ready and headstrong into to overwhelm, we're just going to overwhelm the patients and sometimes yeah. ourselves, yeah. right? Like as the practitioners. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's why, you know, we we even at Lido, we've talked through how at times it can be so difficult to complete things like thorough assessments. Because with assessments, you're, you know, expected to, you know, for, for managed health purposes to ask all of these really intensive questions when you've known mm -hmm. a person for all of an hour, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I even, I weave in some of the, you know, experience and just knowing that that's not helpful a lot of the times where I give people outs, right? I'm very slow paced with the work that I do, especially if I know there's a really expensive, expansive trauma history. I let people know, hey, we're going to get there eventually. You'll let me know when when you're ready. And another way of saying that is not that I say this explicitly to patients, but I can say it here. I'm going to know when your body's ready, right? Like I'm going mm -hmm. to know when when we've established enough regulation, when we've established enough bandwidth to be able to then to go into some of those caverns of trauma. Um, right. it's, it's not helpful to go there first. Yeah. And you, you mentioned, it's really well said, Leslie, you mentioned managed care um, and, and sort of the requirements sometimes of uh, like, you know, proof of results, proof, you know, goal setting and all that stuff. And yet, I would I would propose that somatic experiencing, just like internal family systems therapy, even though they're evidence based, um, and increasingly so, they're you know they're they're not um, they're what's the what's the word I was gonna they're not results oriented, mm -mm. right? They're and, and well, that can be a tough sell. Is that a tough sell to to people coming in saying I I want to you know do I want to work with you or the person who says that they tend to you know basically work with people in 10 sessions, 12 sessions and, and make them feel happier. Right. Oh, 
it's it's so tough. And I'm feeling this even in a real way again with that family member that I mentioned. You know, there's there's a tremendous amount of healing that can happen, I think, in 10 sessions. But in my opinion, that barely scrapes the surface. Um, because so often, you know, what I'm also just fascinated by and, and sometimes just downright impressed by is our tendency toward our unconscious to kind of bring closer to us ways in which we can reenact old trauma history. And so 10 sessions is not going to come near maybe decades of unconsciously being drawn toward, you know, maybe relationships that mimic, you know, the family of origin in which like, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe the family of origin was really hostile and, you know, chaotic, you know, 10 sessions might help to regulate the nervous system. Right. And I think there's, there's a lot that to be said for how beneficial that can be. It can really help people to, you know, find a deeper sense of calm, find a deeper sense of being able to kind of not be at the, like the mercy of their emotions. Um, but if we're really looking at, you know, how to free themselves or how to free up a person to restore a deep sense of dignity and vital life energy back. Um, I don't think that's, that's achievable in short-term therapy. In fact, I think my, in my opinion, humbly, I think it's our responsibility to pace and slow down um, an approach in which we're, we're kind of like the the worthy and humble you know, witnesses of being able to be in a space with someone who is able to share some of the things from their past, right? Like that yeah. takes time. Yeah. It, it takes a, it takes a tremendous time. amount of attunement, um, right. safety. So I I tend to you know even though um, you know Lido Wellness Center like our our you know kind of approach is. Um, in like our high acuity care is around five weeks of time. And then people can extend into our lower intense program, which can go for a range of days. Um, Our average length of time is around 60 days. Um, And even then, right, like we're working really carefully on supporting people to to have aftercare after this, right? And knowing Mm -hmm. that, okay, Mm -hmm. we've just scratched the surface of some of this important work. We want to make sure that in their, you know, long-term care that they have accessibility to EMDR therapists, somatic trained workers, body oriented providers. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think it's so Mm -hmm. important. Right. I I did an episode um, on suicidality. Well, really two episodes now. Um, come to think of it, one was one was with an IFS practitioner, and we talked about this. I think revolutionary approach, which IFS brings, that I think somatic experiencing could, brings as well. Maybe you can comment on, which is that you know a, a person's impulse or desire to take their own life or um, remove what they think is the problem, right? This part of them that says, "Just get rid of yourself," right? You, you know, this really critical voice. Um, when we challenge that, it actually uh, it gets bigger, and a lot of the treatment approaches out there are directly trying to challenge them, come up with a safety plan, don't do it. Of course, all well intentioned things that we would we would say to anybody that we would, we love, in fact, for good reason. And yet, at the same time, we we're not understanding the deeper reason why this person feels like that that's the only option they have, um, and so that because of that rift, then they feel more lost and more compelled to act from it. Um, so he spoke a great deal about that. I'd, I'd reference people to, to uh, watch and listen to the Michael Elkin episode. IFS has a lot to say about, you know, what we call firefighter behaviors, mm-hmm. the parts of us that, in contrast to to the managers in our system, they're actually polarized with the managers because managers like to think ahead and prepare. They don't like messes. They don't like problems. And so they they get the, they do the right thing. And the firefighters show up when it's like way too late to do the right thing. It's like f this. I've got to, I've got to blast this person with a gallon of vodka. You know, I've got to, I've got to somehow get you out of here. And I don't care what the cost is. We'll worry about that later. Well, obviously, that when that behavior escalates, you know, it becomes sometimes uh, the price, the cost is their life. And so, um, but the firefighters at their at their core, they're actually well intentioned. And once you start talking to them and getting the person to to speak to those parts of them with respect for the first time. Like, oh my gosh, this is the only thing that's working for you? How amazing is that? 
it's like, the, first of all, they say, what, what did you just say to me? And then right. they're like, their nervous system starts to relax. Right. Because they're like, wait, maybe this person understands something that I kind of understand, but I'm also afraid of. Right. You know, the, this nervous system is trying to help me. What, um, what I would offer, and I'm so, I'm so grateful for approaches like IFS. In fact, our team at Lido, we did a two day intensive on IFS because we were just so, we're so, we're so impressed by an approach that, in my opinion, is not afraid to be so human with another person. That's kind of the mm. best way mm. I can say that. Um, because what you were just describing, how so often there is this kind of felt pressure for practitioners to kind of disembark from that attunement to get right into safety planning and behavioral modification. As you were even saying that, Keith, I could feel my anxiety heighten, right? And I think it really speaks to how sometimes there is such a requirement of the person in front of us taking care of us, right? Yeah. Like, like you need to assure me that you're going to be okay rather than, wait a minute, let's like really intimately look at, as you would just described, what's happening here? Let's get yeah. near it. Let's dive into yeah. it. And and I think that I was just attending about a year ago a lecture in which I love that the provider mentioned this. He said, you know, as practitioners, there's been so much more of an emphasis on just regulating patients. They just need to feel better. They just need to feel better. And he's like, if your job as a practitioner is to only make people feel better in front of you, then you're not ready for this type of work. Because... Mm -hmm we have to, as practitioners, be equipped and have a very big container and bandwidth for people seated across from us who aren't feeling better, right? And that it's not their job to assure us with a, you know, a form that says, I'm going to do all of these things and promise you. It's like, no, like we need to understand what actually, to your point, is going on um, to not be afraid of it, you know? Right, right. Yeah, that that thing has a life of its own. and. And, uh, and, you know, come to find out, I think we all have these parts of us that just have lives of their own. And when you can have the freedom to speak for that, um, and, and allow those movements to happen, then, then you can, then you can do the steering, then you can, right. then you can edit and decide, okay, maybe that was a little too much because <laughs> I know the power of it now I can pull it back. But if I don't even know the power, it's going to have to be pushing for the boundaries all the time and trying to find a place. So why don't we just give it a place and say it's welcome here no matter what it looks like or sounds like. Right. And then all of a sudden it settles in and starts to sort of, you know, maybe harmonize with um, other parts of the system. And like, look at, as I hear you saying that, I mean, again, so that other piece, right? I mentioned like I could feel that activation. Mm. I felt my shoulders come down, right? right. And just hearing you describe if, it, if we can just speak to it so it has a place. Um, yeah. Then we can. Everybody see. wants a place, right? <laughs> That's what we all want. We all we all want to go home at the end of the day and and know where where to go, right? So, right. Yeah. It's you know, everything's welcome. Everything that's happening inside of us is welcome. I think there's there's so much of an expectation for anyone and everyone to do far too much. Um, there's not enough emphasis on play and restore time. Um, and so, you know, I, I think sometimes, and I, I don't even think it, I know it. Um, I used to definitely be a practitioner that was not nearly as boundaried as I am today, who would just say, well, my, my job is to help people. So I'm just going to help as many people as I can. Um, and that doesn't work. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> right. we, we need our own outlets. We need, we need humor. We need a way to like kind of shake some of this off um, so that we yeah. can rise again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Leslie Tate Gould, thank you so much for being with me here today on The Soul of Life. I appreciate what you're bringing to people and and uh, I'm happy to help people find out more about you. Is there anything else you want to speak to uh, or share where people can find you? Yeah, I'd love for, you know, just to share that you can find um, my work and also the, the amazing work that our clinic is doing at our website at LidoWellnessCenter.com. 
Um, we are also on social media. We've got a YouTube channel. So there's also some wonderful videos and sections on, you know, just different strategies, different interventions that we use right within the clinic and that are, you know, just easy to grab onto and, and use in your own day to day life. If you want to bring in some more mindful movement um, and just learn a little bit more about our integrative practice. Very cool. Nice. So nice speaking with you, Leslie. Thank you so much, Keith. Thanks for having me. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or, or hear more, get access to courses and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrum. All right, I will go.